I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Sherry prophesied and didn't know what I was going to talk about or where I was going to talk about. And she prophesied over Daniel, part of the scripture. And so I want to teach tonight on the subject entitled, Built to Last. Now it's a follow-up to where I was last week. And if you were last week, I laid a lot of stuff out there, gave a lot of stuff out. And so I want to do a follow-up to that tonight entitled, Built to Last. And I'd encourage you to get the message from last week that, that was, was entitled, It's Not What You Know, But It's Who You Know. And I mean, it's Jesus. Amen. It's all about Jesus. And then I want to talk about Built to Last. How many you know Jesus is building His church? There's a lot of things that are going on in the earth today, but Jesus said He was building His church. As I see it as a fivefold ministry leader, everything ought to emanate and flow out of the church. Now, I wish, I wish I could say everything does, but everything doesn't. And there's reasons for that, both good and bad. I mean, so, but, but the bottom line is everything does it. But I want to teach tonight on the subject built to last. Take a look at you at verse 4. It says this, as you come to him, the living stone, everybody say Jesus. Jesus. Note this, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I want you to look again at the verse. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. The word is being built. That means it is in the continuous present tense. It doesn't stop. It is ongoing till the day you take your last breath. Now, the word used there in the word build, it's the Greek word uh, uh, oikidomeo, and it means this. It means to rear up. It means to build up. It means to construct. It means edification. Again, it means to rear up, build up. It means to construct or edify. If you're like me, uh, I like radio. I like television. I'm a news guy. I admit it readily. And how many of you know that sometimes news can be good, sometimes news can be bad, and you have to filter it. I talk to my TV. When I disagree with something or when I believe it's wrong or it's not in line with the Bible, I shout out loud oftentimes what I believe the truth to be. Because I'm going to declare things out of my mouth. Whatever they say, if it's not lining up with the Word, I'm going to decree what the Word of God says. But then along with that, there's just stuff that, commercials that happen and things like that. Now I'll be going down the road at times with my radio on, and I'll hear a commercial. Maybe you've heard the very same commercial, and it's about Mahindra tractors. Anybody ever heard the co commercial about Mahindra tractors? The Mahindra tractors. Now, we're in America. We've heard of John Deere. We've heard of Massey Ferguson. We've heard of all these other Caterpillar tractors that are out there. But this Mahindra thing, it's kind of been new according to my understanding because I was a kid, and believe it or not, when I was in the ninth grade, I went to FFA. And I took, no, excuse me, that's wrong. Uh, uh, that's not right. I, I wasn't an FFA. I was, I was in a class that the FFA guys went to. In that class, I was a sophomore in high school, so I was 15 years of age. And that class was basically for the ranch and farm kids that were in all of South Dakota where I lived at, in the western South Dakota. Because where I grew up, most of those kids were ranchers or farmers. A lot of them that would come to our school. I'm not the majority wasn't, obviously, but there was a segment. And so I, would, I knew some of those guys. So I got in this class, and it was a class that taught you a lot about this and that and everything else. So I learned about animals. I learned about chickens. I learned about cows. I learned about hogs and dogs and frogs. I learned about it all. And so in that class, one of the things also that was offered at the end of it was a class on learning how to operate machinery. So that summer, I remember going to the fairgrounds, and what you learned how to do is you took a course that you could take in order to learn how to, you know, back a tractor up and to put stuff into the power takeoff shaft and all those kinds of things. Does anybody understand any of this kind of stuff that I'm talking about? How to use your levers, the hydraulics to turn the bucket up, turn the bucket down, all of that. All that goes along with tractors. So I'm talking about tractors now and the longevity and the life of a tractor and a Mahenda tractor, that it's built to last. How many of you know that when you have a product, you want to make sure that it's built to last? How many of you know cars don't always, aren't built to last? I mean, especially in today's arena, there's a lot of stuff it seems like is junky. It falls apart way sooner than it used to be. And I'm also a fan of this show that's called uh, Pawn Stars. Like Make sure you understand what I said. I said Pawn Stars, P-A-W-N Stars. 
And what happens during my noon hour when I go in, I'll go in 30 minutes before the lifting guys that I lift with, and I'll do my 30 minutes of cardio. And I plug my headphones in, and sometimes it'll be Pawn Stars, sometimes I'm watching Fox, or sometimes I'm watching the fishing show. It depends on what I put on or what's on at that time. But on Pawn Stars, uh, on this one day, this guy that usually does their mechanic work for them, he got in this 1978 El Camino, and it was a pretty straight vehicle. And he brought it in, and he repaired it and restored it, and it was in mint condition. I mean, the tires, the silver wheels that were on it, the chromes that were on it, the paint job was impeccable, the upholstery was completely redone, a brand new engine slammed in, and that thing was a rockin' rod. He barely had it completed, and there was a buyer already they brought in. And he says, I am not selling this for any less than $20 thousand dollars the guy came in of course he wanted to bargain he says well i'll give you 17 for it he goes ain't taking 17 it's 20 or nothing the guy says well how about 17 you know you know how you dicker and he goes listen i'm not selling it for anything less than twenty thousand dollars finally the guy he says he took a ride in it and, i mean they peeled out and they were squealing all over the place burning rubber and going down the road and of course none of you've ever done that right <laughs> anybody ever had a car and peeled out Helen, when she grew up at John R. Rogers in Spokane, Washington, they used to have this thing. You know how you have the speed bumps to keep the kids from going too fast with the, their cars and burning out and everything? Well, what they did in that is they reversed it. They put in a divot instead of a bump. So these guys got smart, and they put some kind of fluid or flammable fluid in. I don't remember what it was. Lit it on fire, so the thing had a big burning trough through the middle of it, and that's what they <laughs> burned out in was that instead. So the point is the guy sold it for $20,000. The car looked immaculate. I'm telling you all of this because I really am going somewhere. You and I have been built to last. Can I tell you the church of Jesus Christ has been built to last? It's 2,000 years ago that Jesus Christ planted his church. It started off with 12 individuals. They lost one because he committed Harry Carey. You all remember that story. The guy's name was Judas. Not only that, but he was a thief. He was the keeper of the treasury of Jesus' ministry. We get nervous because we hear of things that happen in today's church. Here's Jesus who had his one disciple, and the guy was a thief. He was an embezzler right in the midst of his team. You would have thought Jesus would have known about that. So they then grew by 120. Remember the story? Then they grew by 3,000. And then they added another 5,000. And you know what? The church hasn't stopped growing since. And it continues to this day all over the world, comprised of every individual who says yes and amen. Jesus Christ, you're my Savior and you're my Lord. It's the same in the Philippines where you're ministering at. Though the people may be more my size and a little bit darker than me and, and maybe, you know... M- you know, I'm just telling you, it's true. It doesn't matter if it's there. Or if when we go to Asia, when we minister to the Asian people, they're there, they're the same. They love Jesus. They, they talk a different language and you've got to try to communicate with them and, and you don't understand a word they're saying, but they, they love Jesus just as much as we do. If you go to India, it's the same of the people of India. It doesn't matter where you go. That if you go to the, to the depths of Africa, the people are the same and they love Jesus. That is the church of the living God. Do I hear an Amen. Now, in the New Testament, the word church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, is used 115 times. Of the 115 times that the word church is used, 92 occurrences are in direct reference to a local church. You think that maybe Jesus is concerned about the local church. I would say amen to that because he is. That implies something that every person ought to be a part of a local church. When you see the writers of the New Testament church, they were writing to people that were in local churches. When you read the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and chapter 3, they were written specifically to seven churches. They address them as the seven churches of Asia. Not only that, but he speaks to the angel, who I believe Angelos is really the messenger. It's the pastor, the lead shepherd of that body that he's addressing with a word to. Can I tell you, the Lord's still speaking today. And he's still speaking to the church today. So i got to tell you something. I'm very pro-church. 
Now, am I a kingdom guy? Absolutely, I'm a kingdom guy. Jesus says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The rule, the domain, the dominion of God. But guess what? The church is the vehicle, Sherry, that God is bringing the kingdom with. So when you and I and our team and your lovely husband, Vern, were in mainland China and we did our healing seminar and we were under wraps because we couldn't be found out because we were illegal in mainland China and we did that healing seminar, come on somebody. We were preaching to those people that were hearing and receiving the engrafted word of God that their faith might grow up. That they were leaders of churches. That they were willing to risk their life to die for the cause of Christ and His church. As we brought the kingdom of God we were the vehicles that brought the kingdom. Ambassadors of the kingdom. So I'm telling you something. The Lord's up to something. He's building His church and it's built to last. The church is never a building. It's always people. It's always people. It's always people. So in this text, there are two things I want to talk about in the next five minutes that I have. (laughs) Ten minutes, 15 minutes. We'll see how long it takes. You know me. I don't get nervous if I don't get it done now. I don't have to jam it all in tonight. I can do it next week, and then I'll let somebody else take a turn. We'll let Elizabeth take a couple nights, and we'll let Lloyd go at it a couple times, and somebody else. Helen, we need to get you back in the loop. Um, I mean, I mean, she just comes up here, and you know the flow's on her because she just goes with the Holy Ghost. So we've got to cut her loose with her teaching gift, and, and, but we've got to give you that full hour that you need <laughs> to get the job done. That's how you know a teacher. They go long and they go strong. <laughs> All right, as you come to him, that's Jesus. He's the living stone. Note the word living. He's not dead. He's alive. He also says, rejected by humans. Isn't it amazing that those that don't love the Lord have rejected him? So if you've ever dealt with rejection, I'm going to tell you, you don't don't feel like you're the only person. Jesus also had to deal with it. Here's the key. Don't get a spirit of rejection. See, some people have rejected and they've picked up that spirit of rejection. It's on them. And so what ends up happening, you end up becoming what you are. And so if you've been rejected and you carry that wound of rejection, what ends up happening, you inadvertently, unknowingly, oftentimes will, will repel and reject other people. And the key is getting free from that spirit of rejection. Jesus didn't walk around with a, oh man, they don't like me. They don't really like me. That wasn't his concern. His concern was fulfilling the, master's, the, the, the father's mandate. And so it ought to be the same for you and I. So it says then, but he was, note this, chosen by God. And so this is what I put, chosen by the Father. Now remember, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're a, we believe in the Trinity. We believe in the Father, we believe in the Son, we believe in the Holy Spirit. So he says here that the Father said, man, you are chosen and precious, very valuable to him. Now think about your own self for a moment and your own belongings that you have. Think about your collectibles, wherever you have them stored at. Are they in a safe? Are they locked up in a safe box somewhere? Are they openly out somewhere? And maybe it's something that's not necessarily of jewelry or value of that, but you have a collectible that's important to you. I was sharing with somebody the other day, and I was talking about, you know, collectibles. And of my mom, you know, my mom passed away when she was 47. I think I was about 29 when my mom died. Is that right? We were pastoring in Roseburg. I think I was 29 years of age. My mom died way too early, by the way. Maybe 30, yeah, I was probably 30, she's 47, so whatever the age breakdown is that. But needless to say, my mom had my sister and I when I was young. She had my sister when she was like 17, and then two years later she had me, so whatever that is. She got married, she was, in, she was 16. So my mom died young. And when I think back, my dad says, well, would you like anything? And we went back, you know how you are, you know. I, I, I've, I've been away from home since I was 18, basically. So, you know, my brothers and my sister have really been around the homestead and all that where we grew up at. So I've really been away, communicate, visit, those kinds of things. I said, you know, there's really nothing of mom's that I would like except maybe her Bible. And my sister said, I, I, want, my, I want mom's Bible. My sister's two years older than me. And, you know, because she wanted that, I says, you can have it. I'm honored for you to have that Bible. And my sister really cherishes that keepsake to her. In fact, Two years ago, has it been two years ago or a year? That's a year ago, I guess, that I went back and I did her oldest daughter's wedding ceremony. And it was an interesting thing as we were there. It was a big backyard wedding. 
And on the place where the unity candle was at, here's my mom's Bible laying there. It, it, <clears throat> it's choking me up now, but it brought <laughs> tears to my eyes because it meant so much to my sister. Now, I'm in the Word all the time. I peel through Bibles every couple of years. I burn them up. I mean, I abuse them, honestly, in a good way. I don't write them anymore because now I use my cell phone for devotions. But I, and I don't know. I'm still not sure I like that method, but I've been doing it for a year. But most of my Bibles, except for this one, are written in like you cannot believe. So I said that to say this, chosen and precious see to somebody else, my mom's Bible may not been that big of a deal, but to my sister is very important, has great value and great meaning. And so what I'm saying to all of us, here's the concept, because Helen said this, your love never fails, it never gives up, it never gives up on me, as she almost turned it into a chant tonight to get a revelation deep in your spirit. It's exactly what's being said in the text tonight. You're chosen, you're precious, you're chosen, you're precious. To me, that speaks of love huge, big time. And so we're talking about Jesus. Now, I really haven't got into my message too much. That's all introduction. <laughs> he then says, going on, you also like living stones. Look at somebody and say, you're alive. You're alive. Somebody else, you're living. You're living. Because living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, listen as he quotes now the book of Isaiah, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him, that's Jesus, will never be put to shame, prophesying 700 years before the birth of Christ. Now it goes on to you, now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. I'll get back to that. That's a quote from uh, Psalms 118.22 and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Again, Isaiah now, this is Isaiah 8, 14. And it says, they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. If you're taking notes, write down point number one, stones in the spiritual house. Remember what I said? Jesus is building his church. You alluded to it. You have that concept, Jeff, in you. Why? It's the DNA of our house. You've been around here long enough that you understand the house is not a building. The house is the house of the Lord. And the house is the universal house of the Lord. But as I said again, 92 times, it is the local church. And because you've planted, and the Lord planted you in this house, because you resonate with what is going on around here, what's ended up saying is, Lord, I'm planted in this house. And the only person that can move me is you, Lord. Otherwise, I'm here. I'm planted in the house of the Lord because there what happens the Bible says in Psalms chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 those who are planted in the house of the Lord they will bring fruit forth fruit in due season they're, when they grow old their leaf will stay green and they will not wither they're going to remain pliable they're going to be made useful for the kingdom of God and the things of the Lord they're going to be, remain strong even into their old age. And as I said last year, uh, last year, <laughs> I said last year probably too, but last week, I said if you're 120, 60 is only middle age. Praise God. Stones in the spiritual house, it equals building. It's talking about building. One commentary says this, our built up is the main verb in this section. The choice of the word shows that the building is not haphazard, but is according to an intelligent plan brought to a reality by a master craftsman. That's the Father, which sets forth the fact of our integration into the body of Christ. The overall design is a spiritual house, which describes the nature of the body of Christ. That is a house in which God dwells. Come on, somebody. When you think of a house, think of the house that God is building. The Bible says in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. He's gone. He's been gone for almost 2,000 years. How do you know the shack that you're going to live in cannot begin? I'm, I'm, I'm just t toying with you right now because we talk about I've got a mansion over the hilltop. I'm telling you, we've got a place up there that God is building yep. for us yep. that cannot be compared to what is here on planet Earth. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. So we see this dimension. It's a metaphor that the writer's using Peter who walked with Jesus. He was part of the inner three. He has a revelation in, in regards to the house that God is building, that Jesus is building. Now note this word back here. It says, you also, verse 5, are like living stones are being built into a spiritual house. The word is this. It has the imp implication of this. It is a already dressed stone. Think about this. When you have bricks and you have blocks that you build with, how do you know 
that has to start somewhere. You know, it always starts with concrete and sand or aggregate of some kind. So sand, you have mortar mix. You have sand and cement that you put together in water, this admixture. And because the concrete has the strengthening agent in it, you mix it together to create that block or that brick, and it's dressed. Now remember, we must make an analogy back to the Old Testament because in the Old Testament, there were basically the tabernacle of Moses, which was the tabernacle they went, remember, they, the, 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 the priests would go, they'd carry it on their shoulders. There was the tabernacle of David, the place of praise and worship. I talked about that last week out of the book of, maybe it was Sunday morning. Was it Sunday morning out of Acts 15? And then, how many of you know there was Solomon's tab- temple that Solomon built? Solomon built that temple. Remember that? Are you all with me? David amassed the materials, but Solomon built it. They dedicated it. And then Herod's temple, another temple. I know there's going to be a third temple. It's going to be in the, it's going to be in the millennial reign. And so what I'm saying, all of those things prefigure, really, if you will, the dwelling place of God. But where the Lord is dwelling right now is in the spiritual house It's in the body of believers. The reason we come to praise and worship isn't just so we can jump up and down and shout. In fact, in some churches, they don't even do that. I'm glad you guys are ignited worshipers. I'm telling you the truth. You're ignited worshipers. When the band sings, you begin to praise the Lord. You begin to clap. Some of you have to get on key. We'll have to help you with that because you have no rhythm. And if you ever see me turn around strong going like this, you're going to know that you're off beat and you need to get with me. Remember, I'm a drummer. It's two and four. So watch the drummer. When he's hitting two, that's time to clap. Bam. One, two, one. Huh? The snare. snare. Yeah, watch his hand. This is the snare. Bam. 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 Do I need to give you a drum lesson over here? My point is this, is that is that we worship the Lord. When we talk about David's tabernacle, it's standing, it's hands raised, it's hands waving, it's with our mouth, it's talking, it's shouting. Give the Shabbat, shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. It says, it says, it says uh, clap your hands, this is Psalms 47, clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. I'm telling you, it is a biblical, acceptable way of worshiping the Lord. Act like you're alive because you're a living stone. You're not a dead stone, you're an alive stone. You've been infused with the anointing of the Spirit of God who dwells on the inside of you. If my Bible serves me correctly and my mind serves me correctly, the Bible says in Romans 8 that the same Spirit that reigns Christ from the dead dwells in you. It will quicken your mortal body. That's the King James. I reviewed it. I went back to that from my childhood days. It'll quicken your mortal body. Your body's going to vibrate with some kind of electricity. (laughs) Act like you're alive. Come on. Everybody nudge everybody. So he's talking about you right now. So we recognize Jesus is the living stone. We already know Matthew 16, verse 16 through 18. We already talked about that a couple weeks ago, remember? Jesus said to his disciples, who do the men say I am? Some say Elijah, say some other prophet. But who do you say I am? And Peter spoke on behalf of the others. You are Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, this revelation was not given by flesh and blood, but it was given by my Father in heaven. Therefore, verse 18, upon this rock, what the rock of revelation, that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, I will build my church, the ecclesia, the ecclesia, the called out ones. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Remember what I said 92 times. The church is talked about the local church. Jesus is into the local church. That's why people need to be a part of the local church. People say, well, I don't like the church. There are a bunch of hypocrites down there. Well, tell me any place there's not hypocrites. Come on. Get real. It just goes along with it. There, there's hypocrites everywhere you go. Get over your bad self. That's no reason not to go. Well, all they want is your money. Well, I don't know. The last time I went into Safeway, they wanted my money. The last time I went into Bymart, they wanted my money. The last time I went anywhere, they wanted my money. And they want as much as you can give them. And then some. I'm amazed. I'll go in like on Sunday afternoons, we'll do buzzing around, and Helen starts working on things for the church, and so I'll do do the shopping for us for the week. And you know what it is? It's like a couple of bags of apples, a bag of oranges, a a bunch of bananas, and we we do organic nuts, whole nuts, like whole almonds and whole... uh, 
cashews, and then I'll get a little M&M bag to mix in with that to flavor that up a little bit, and, and, and then we'll get her, her uh, tea, and I'll get my, uh, my green tea, and, and we, get, we have our things that we like, and then whatever else, and then I'll get our, like, our, uh, what's the lettuce we get? We get the certain kind, romaine lettuce, romaine hearts, because we don't eat the other stuff, not good for you, we chop the end up, you know, all that kind of stuff, so, so that's what I do, but I get up there, and I have one of those, I like the little shopping cart. I don't like the big honking, you know, I don't like the Cadillac, all right? I like the littler model because I can, I, can I can weave in on a traffic so fast that sucker, new, 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 new. I get it done quick, man. The smart car. There you go, buddy. But not the smart car. That thing's no good. I won't ride in that. So I'm in and out of traffic, and I get over there, and she starts ringing up, and I punch in my Freddie Meyer card, you know, I get my number, my, my secret friendly, you know, number, the mark of the B6. No, I'm just kidding. See if you're paying attention. <laughs> we can have fun, can't we? Sheesh. Okay. So anyway, I punch. I, you know, they, they, they go ahead and run the scanner over my forehead. Or over. <laughs> Jim, it's okay. Take a deep breath. It's all right. <laughs> so I give him my number, and then, I, and then I put my card in there. It says, okay, we'll wait for you to finish. And I go, oh, my goodness, is that much? You got to be kidding me. Are you serious? Oh, is that the reason? Oh, okay. I got to go to Safeway. All right, that's it. Go to Winco. Winco, 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 Winco. Okay, Winco. Thousand is spelled T H O S U N D. You can send it to Word and Spirit International Church. 10,000 would even be better. All right. For the free advertisement. Everything costs money in life. We, we can't meet in this building without lights, electricity, heating, air conditioning. The chairs your rusty dusty is in. Your sweet behind is in. <laughs> I mean, all, it just takes money. It really does. And we could go sit out in the trees out there, but I'm going to tell you something. You guys ain't going to go for that very long once the rain starts. And then you could be in a tent, but it, I'm telling you, there's no heat in that sucker, and it gets about January. You ain't staying in that long. I'm not staying in that long. Now, I can do it. I'm in Africa, but I'm not there forever. <laughs> I live in America. That's right. It's all relative, by the way. Do you know it still takes money to do stuff in Africa? I've been there. I've been to India. It takes money to do stuff there. Been to China. It takes money to do stuff there. I mean, wherever we go, it takes money. Money is never the issue. Money is a medium of exchange. God can get money to us to do what he needs to do. All right, let's move on. <laughs> so Jesus is the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen and precious to God the Father. So believers then, we're the living stones. We're being built, note this, continuously into a spiritual house. And because I like Ephesians so well, and I like the Ephesians 4 passage, I'll end with that tonight, and then we'll pick it up here, point two, next Wednesday. And then I think I'll stand down for a few Wednesdays and let some other preachers and teachers teach for some Wednesdays. Ephesians 4.11. You know I was going to go there, didn't you? I bet you guys take bets on the side. When's, when's John going to go to Ephesians 4.11? Is he going to talk out of that tonight at any time? I don't want to let anybody down. Everybody say, Jesus is building his church. And it's built to last. Say, I'm a part of it. Look at someone say, you're a part of it. Look at the other neighbor say, you're a part of it. Here's how he's building. Here's how he's building. You can say that too. Here's how he's building. All right, you ready? Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. You ready? All right. Uh, Ephesians 4, verse 11. So Christ himself, it wasn't Santa Claus. It wasn't Buddha. It wasn't Confucius. It was Jesus. Okay, Jesus himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Know how I use the word plural. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Here's the reason why. You ready? To equip his people. Why? For works of service. Diakonos. It's the same word that's used for deacon and deaconess. So that the body of Christ may be, here's the big word, built up, okidemeo, until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become what? 
immature, no mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now I want you to go, I want you to go quickly. I said it was going to be the last verse, but I've got 30 seconds left. Go to 1 John. 1 John. All right? 1 John. Hallelujah, Jesus. All right, I want you to jump down to verse number 12 of chapter 2. Okay, 1 John 2, verse number 12. I'm writing to you, dear children. The word is brephos. You ever heard of briefs? Same word. Brephos. Brief. Because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. What do babies do? They poop their pants in their briefs. So when you come to faith in Christ, we don't, act, we don't expect you to act like an adult. You're going to probably act like a kid. And you may have a mess or two. I'm getting down and dirty here. I want, you to, I want to talk about the realities of Christianity. Now he says, I'm writing to you fathers. Okay, the fathers should be the mature ones. Because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men. Technon is the Greek word there. Okay? Why is that? Because you've overcome the evil one. He goes back to dear children. I write to you, dear children, because you've known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you've known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you're strong and the word of God lives in you and because you have overcome the evil one. There's a mouthful in all of that. What it's talking about is three levels of growth. There's that brephos stage, there's that adolescent stage, and there's the mature age. Listen, everybody sitting here is at some point in that experience. And the key is, I don't want to stay here. I want to move to the next level. Why? Because I want to be built up. Why? That I might be built to last. Matthew 7, I close with this. Doggone it. I have no time left. I'm out of time. I used all my time. Says that there were two kinds of builders one built on the sand, one built on the rock. You know, it's how Jesus closes the Sermon on the Mount. You all know that, right? Closes the Sermon on the Mount. He says, One built on the sand, one built on the rock. Here's the deal the storms came to both. Because you know what? Storms happen. The rain beat, the winds blew, and it says, And great was the crash of the guy who built on the sand, but the one who built on the rock stood. Why? Built to last. Our goal as a church, because remember I talked about last week, is we're moving forward to build a church that's built to last. And I want you, each and every one of you, our team, as we're building and amassing a leadership team, is to equip all of us that we might be built to last until Jesus comes. The reason Mar Jolson leaves America, goes to the Philippines, because there's a call of God as a missionary on her life. She's enabling those that are in the Philippines, those students that have gathered around through her teaching and her training and her writing, is that they might be built to last. See, when the Lord looks down, though He sees the different people groups, we're His body. We may speak different languages, maybe be different heights and different cultures, but we're the body of Christ, and He's building to last. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're a part of what's going on. And I only can see it getting better and better and better in the days ahead.